recording now. Go ahead and shake that again. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Linda, and thank you to ICPSR. Uh, my name is Noreen Goldman. I'm based at Princeton University, and my other colleagues, co-investigators on this project, are also online, Maxine Weinstein and Dana Gly of Georgetown University. Um, so we'll all participate in the answering of questions. And I have on this first slide a list of the many, of some of the many essential people from the Health Promotion Administration in Taiwan who made this survey possible. Uh, we call the survey the Social Environment and Biomarkers of Aging Study, CBAS for short, and it's a study designed to look at the physiological linkages among stress, the social environment, and health. Okay, so what I'm going to do in this presentation is give you some background of the CBAS survey, tell you how it fits into the parent survey known as TILSA, tell you who's in the cohort, actually cohorts of CBAS, what it is that we've been measuring, a little bit of an introduction to what we found in several of our papers, and then the main strengths and weaknesses of these data, and finally, how you can get access to the data, which I presume is an important part of this undertaking. Again, if you have questions along the way, write them into the box, and if it's a question of clarification, we will try to answer it as we go along. If not, we'll answer it at the end, and we'll make sure to leave time at the end for these questions. Okay, so some background for CBAS. CBAS was one of the very first, what we're now calling biosocial surveys, the idea being to take what had been a more conventional health interview or social science survey, household survey, with a broad representative sample and introduce physiological measurements, biological measurements into this kind of survey. We had several major goals. One was to investigate how biomarkers of chronic illness are related to stressful experience. It really, one of our original goals was to evaluate the theory of allostatic load, the idea that chronic stressors lead to wear and tear on the body, which in turn leads to heightened physiological responses and biological parameters. Many of the clinical parameters we measure at physicians and other parameters become out of normal operating ranges, like blood pressure gets too high, cholesterol gets too high, but they don't come back to normal, they stay there. That's the idea behind allostatic load but it hadn't really been well tested with the kind of social science data we were interested in. Another goal was to think about understanding social disparities in health and how biological markers could help us understand the kinds of pathways through which these social disparities are operating. Another was to explore the associations among the biological markers and other measures of health and functioning, as well as survival, so physical health and mental well-being. And a final major goal was to think about once we have two rounds of biological function, we can then look at how biological measures change over time. And we wanted to think about what factors in the environment lead to that kind of change and what the consequences of that kind of biological change are for subsequent health and survival. So this is a diagram that motivated our original project. If you ignore the red part in the middle, and you guys can probably see my mouse, so if you ignore this physiological response part, a very common social science framework was to think about how the social environment, people's social position, their social connection to others in their network, and the kinds of choices they make as individuals and within their families, how those are related to challenges in life, which we use more or less synonymously with the concept of stressors, stressful experiences in the environment and how those also relate to health outcomes, physical and mental health outcomes. What was missing from many social science surveys is how that operates physiologically. Okay, there are many clinical type samples that don't do so well at getting the social environment and don't do so well at getting life challenges, but they do look at how physiological response relates to outcomes. And our idea was to put these all together um, in a population-based survey, so a very non-select population representative survey of sufficient sample size to begin to investigate these linkages through physiological response. Okay, so some of the unique features of CBAS. First, that was one of the first surveys to do this on a large population representative sample. In fact, when we tried to do this, people told us we were crazy. 
and we wouldn't be able to get funding. It's now obviously a very common type of survey in the social sciences. Um, our idea was to get markers across multiple physiological systems, so not just the kind of clinical measurements one often gets taken in a, in a clinical checkup, but also to include non-clinical measures that I'll describe in a little bit. Um, to get a broad range of psychosocial and demographic information from the household survey in which this was embedded. To follow up people regularly, longitudinally, with closely um, spaced follow-ups. Um, this was embedded in a rich, larger survey that I'll talk about, so we have more information than just that we could collect as part of CBAS. Okay, and to have advantages over other kinds of bio biosocial surveys that existed in the sense that we had a broader sampling frame and we had more social information that would typically come in a survey that focused on clinical or biological or genetic information. Okay, so the next thing I'd like to talk about is how does CBS fit with the parent survey, which is known as TILSA, the Taiwan Longitudinal Survey of Aging. So CBS is an extension of TILSA. TILSA began in 1989 in Taiwan. Formerly it was an institute of family planning that then got into studying health among the elderly. And they began in 1989 with a national sample of people 60 and over. And since 1989, they have followed the sample. Many, of, of course, of the original cohort has died. And it's been supplemented with younger people every three to four years since then and they're currently in the field with another round. So in that sense, the survey covers a long span of time. CBAS took a subsample of the people who were interviewed in 1999 with TILSA, and it began its interviewing in the year 2000, as I'll describe. And it has two major components. One is, as TILSA has done, it interviewed people in their home in a somewhat you know, standard household survey kind of format. But then it also did a fairly extensive medical exam and a biomarker collection of the same respondents who were interviewed in the home. So this is a very brief outline of what TILSA and CBAS look like. Um, again, we began in 1989. The Taiwanese began with the population 60 and older with a home interview of about 4,000 people. Roughly every three years, people have been re-interviewed. You can see, for example, in 1996, the age dropped to 50 as younger refresher cohorts came into it. CBAS came to play in 2000, and it interviewed people 54 and older, both with a home interview, which had been done in the past, but also with a biomedical component. People were interviewed in 2003, and then CBAS did a second round in 2006, again with a home interview with a biomedical component and with a performance component that I'll describe again in more detail. And you can see roughly the sample sizes of the CBAS on the order of 1,000 people in each round. And I'll describe that in more detail in a minute as well. People were interviewed in 2007, again in 2011. And there's currently a re-interview in progress. And the subsample of CBAS people in the TILSA re-interview get some special questions, such as cognitive questions and performance assessments in 2011. And they're getting additional rounds of performance assessments now. OK, so a question is, who are being interviewed? Who are part of these CBAS cohorts? Okay. In 2000, we interviewed people 54 and older again with two components, a home interview that had almost 1,500 people with a 92% response rate. The medical exam had just over 1,000 people. It was a 68% response of those who were interviewed. Um, at first, that didn't seem very high, but we have to keep in mind that these people were no longer interviewed in their home. They were taken to a hospital for a complete medical exam and contributed specimens that I'll describe in a second. Um, and so, in fact, it is a fairly demanding protocol and a fairly respectable response rate. We did analyze non-response at great length. What we learned is that non-response occurred at both ends of the health spectrum. So the, the people in the poorest health didn't participate in the hospital exam, partly because we excluded people with certain ailments from undertaking this. But it was also the case that the healthiest people found the most conflict with their busy schedules. They were largely people working full time. And so they didn't participate. So on average, self-reported health is the same for those 
with and those without the biomarker data. So to think of it, in some sense, we lost bits of the two tails on the health spectrum. Okay. 2006 CBAS was a follow-up of those people who were interviewed in 2000, plus um, some people who came in as a refresher cohort with the TILSA survey in 2003. So the sample was 53 and older in 2006. Again, there were two components, a home interview of almost 1,300 respondents for a 91% response rate of those survivors of 2000 and 81% of the younger refresher cohort. Just over 1,000 people took the medical exam, and that was 85% of the survivors from 2000 and about 75% of the refresher cohort. We had the same type of non-response in both cases. Um, we lost uh, selectively some of the older people, uh, some of the more educated, but again, on average, self-rated health was very similar between those who participated in the biomarker, what I also call the medical exam component, and those who did not participate. The strategies that we'll describe for the home interviews and the medical exam biomarker collections were quite similar in these two dates, 2000 and 2006. Again, these are the specific CBAS dates, although we draw on information from TILSA before, in between, and after. Okay, so what have we measured? Just to kind of wake you guys up a little bit, I'll throw in some photos. Um, this was the CBAS team in 2006, as my co-investigator Maxine Weinstein here, Dana Gly, these guys are on the phone, on the webinar, and myself here, and the Taiwanese crew who did all of the very difficult, demanding, exhausting work for us. Okay, this was actually part of a pilot survey in 2006 before we did the actual field work. I like this particular photo um, because it, it was part of our uh, pre-testing, but what really struck me at the time, and if you're not familiar with Taiwan, may give you a little inkling, is that this was a field test in a, what they considered to be a rural area. So the concept of rural is clearly quite different from what many of us think about um, in our own country. It also gives you a sense of the U.S. influence with the big M that went up not long before. Okay, so to describe in a little bit more detail what the 2000 data collection looked like, there was a home interview in the household, and about and that took about an hour on average. About three weeks later, people were brought to a hospital. They were typically brought by taxi. Um, they were go told they were going to be given a medical exam that was very much like the exam that was part of national health insurance that's been around type. Taiwan for probably about 20 years. Okay. The night before they came to the hospital, they were asked to collect a 12-hour urine sample, a 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. sample, and I'll describe a little bit why we needed that, but it was certainly a relatively burdensome part of our data collection. So it complicated the logistics of this. Then in the morning, they and their 12-hour urine went for a physical examination in a hospital, in a local hospital. We had a hospital in every one of the primary sampling units in which we were sampling, which was quite extensive since this was a national sample. Um, people had been fasting overnight, and so a blood specimen was taken while they were fasting via vena puncture. So this was not a dry blood spot. This was taking blood from veins and putting it in test tubes and doing centrifuging and that entire operation that gets done typically if you go for a clinical exam. Some of the reasons for people not participating, I mentioned a minute ago that some people were too ill and frail, and we had quite a few exclusion criteria where we just decided we were not going to take any risk and take the person to a hospital. But other times, people couldn't schedule it because we were typically in one primary sampling unit for a week. And if there was no time slot in that week that worked for people, we couldn't do it. Also, we had to schedule people in the morning because people were fasting, and we didn't want people fainting in the afternoons. Um, for some people, they viewed that as trouble, or they just had a national health insurance paid exam, so they didn't think there was a need for an additional exam. So these are some of the kinds of information we collect at the home interview in CBAS in both 2000 and 2006. Standard demographic data, socioeconomic status information, the bit here that may be a little new is what I call subjective social status, or the latter. 
It's a ladder people were shown that's similar to one that was incorporated in the MacArthur scale of subjective social status. The idea of being in addition to asking people about their income and their education and their major occupation, you show people a ladder with 10 rungs and you tell people that it represents where people in Taiwan are positioned with the people who are best off at the top, the people who are worst off at the bottom. You ask the respondent to think about their own situation and compare themselves with others in Taiwan and then place themselves on one of 10 rungs in the ladder. And we have this information at both ways of the survey. Um, one of our goals here was to collect good information on stressors. These are some of the stressors that we collected. I'll show you some more later. But financial stressors, issues related to security. Um, just after we were pilot testing, the Chi Chi earthquake came in 1999 and caused a lot of damage, affected almost everybody to some degree. It's a relatively small country. We, in addition to asking people about stressors, we also ask them about their perceptions of stress. So that we call perceived stress in different domains of their life, health, financial, their job, various family members issues. Um, and we also talk about locus of control. Okay. This is a picture of the consequence of the Chi Chi earthquake in a middle school. So it was quite severe. I indicate here it was a 7.3 earthquake that affected virtually everybody, although severe losses, of course, vary considerably. And we have some measurement um, on those who experience severe losses um, of homes and things of the sort. Okay. Other questions that were collected in the home interview in both 2000 and 2006 include many measures of physical health. Um, the ones I'm listing here are all self-reports. Um, a simple question asking people to rate their own health on a five-point scale, what we call self-rated health status. A list of chronic conditions that they may ever have had or they currently have. Limitations with regard to mobility, limitations with regard to activities of daily living, ADL, or instrumental activities of daily living, IADL. Whether they experienced falls or injuries in the past year. Um, a 10-item subset of the 20-item CESD depression scale, a battery of questions on cognitive function, and a variety of health behaviors. Okay. In 2006, but not in 2000, we had some additions to the home interview. This is what we call performance assessments that I mentioned earlier. They were done for the first time in 2006, but they have also been done in TILSA on the CBAS respondents in 2011 and currently in the field now for 2016. So at the end of the interview, the interviewer administered blood pressure measurements, which were also done in the hospital, but these were done with one of these um, handheld blood pressure instruments, battery operated. They also measured grip strength. There's a picture of a grip strength meter on the right. They measured lung function by measuring peak expiratory flow. They timed how long it took respondents to walk three meters and how long it took respondents to sit down and get themselves up five times from a chair without pressing on the sides of the chair. These are kind of standard performance assessments, particularly for people 60 and over. OK, so several questions were added in 2006 that hadn't been in the 2000 survey. Um, we wanted to know something more about social relationships, and so we added a few questions. We really focused hard on getting better, better measurements of exposure to stressors and better measurements of perceptions of stress. So we asked about whether people were serving as caregivers for other older people, whether they experienced a high rate of daily hassles. We had a listing of major life events they may have experienced in the 12 months, you know, such as a divorce or a move. We had a history of traumatic events they may have experienced in their lifetime, such as child abuse or being victims of serious earthquakes. We added a few questions on personality. Um, we added some questions on physical health. I'll come back to this one that um, has proven to be very interesting, asking the interviewers to rate the person's health status at the end of the interview. Um, questions on chronic pain. Um, to get a little bit more in the way of exercise, we added questions on relaxation practices like Tai Chi that are very common in the Taiwanese population. We added several components of the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, 
And then these are the performance assessments that I mentioned just a minute ago that were done at the end of the interview and administered by the interviewer. Okay. So one of the issues that we faced very early on before we fielded this in 2000 was what biomarkers do we include? Now clearly one can only include things that can be done without great complication in a home setting or um, from the amount of blood that we could take or the urine collection. Right? Um, we were not using very complicated kinds of equipment. Our choice of biomarkers was based in large part on what the MacArthur had, study had done earlier, although we amplified that in the subsequent round. So we collected some basic cardiovascular metabolic markers that we call clinical markers, like cholesterol, measures of diabetes, blood pressure, I'll list these momentarily. We collected neuroendocrine markers having to do with the sympathetic nervous system and the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Right? Remember, a lot of this focus was on response to stressors, so having measures of neuroendocrine markers was essential in this project. We also added markers having to do with the immune system or inflammation, and in fact, these markers have turned out in several respects to be the most powerful, and so we've expanded those that we collected in the second round. Um, so here's a listing of biomarkers that were derived from the blood samples that people gave when they came to the hospital. So standard blood count kinds of measurements like a white blood cell count, um, metabolic measures having to do with glucose, glycosylated hemoglobin, the standard cholesterol measurements, remember people had been fasting, um, a series of inflammatory markers, most commonly known are the interleukin IL-6, that's a major part of the inflammatory response and C-reactive protein that's now been linked to heart disease, um, SE selectin, SI CAM1 that are adhesion molecules having to do with the leukocytes adhe adhering to endothelial cells as part of the inflammation process and the receptor for IL-6. Okay. Um, other kinds of measures we collected and several genetic markers. This was never meant to be a genetic data collection, but we were asked early on to collect the APOE genotype that's been associated with cardiovascular disease and dementia. Um, we also collected 5-HTT LPR, which is a marker that's related to a polymorphism in the serotonin transporter promoter region of the gene um, that we've published a, a little bit about. And we collected telomere length, the, the markers at the end of chromosomes that have gotten a lot of attention in recent years as being a potential marker of aging. Okay, so that's a summary of the blood-based biomarkers. We also collected some markers from the 12-hour urine. <clears throat> we got the total volume of the urine creatinine that was needed to standardize some of these other measurements. And our focus was on cortisol, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine. <clears throat> Again, measuring the APA axis and the sympathetic nervous system axis. As part of the physical exam that was done uh, by a physician and some of these early measurements, um, by nurses. We collected anthropometry, height and weight, waist and hips. These all give us measurements of obesity, waist-hip ratio, or BMI. Uh, we did three readings for blood pressure. We had also done them in the home three weeks prior to this. Pulse and various abnormalities that the physician wrote down in his charts as part of the physical exam. We also collected abdominal ultrasound. I should mention that we've never actually used some of this data. The abdominal ultrasound was collected in part because we tried hard to think about what would make this exam appealing to respondents, given they were also able, at this point, to get a free national health insurance exam. And many indicated that they wished the national health insurance exam would include abdominal ultrasound. There are various abdominal cancers, particularly stomach cancer, that are relatively common in East Asian populations. Um, so we did this partly as a service um, to respondents. Okay. <coughs> um, so while respondents were in the hospital waiting for their physical exam, we collected some additional information. We, in the main household survey, had a battery of questions that had to do with perceptions of stress that were asked in 2000 and were repeated in 2006. We also asked a second stress scale, and we 
added it to the hospital visit so it wouldn't be part of the same questionnaire and potentially confusing. And this was a questionnaire that was a more standard instrument developed by Sheldon Cohen. So we wanted to have both one that was consistent with what had been asked in earlier waves in Taiwan, but also consistent with what people use in the literature. We got an additional biomarker, additional measures in the physical exam. We piloted, but ultimately did not include salivary cortisol. There's a large debate about how best to measure cortisol, and cortisol is a very complicated item to get a good measurement of in terms of how it responds to stress. We did average overnight urine. In some sense, we got an integrated measure of those neuroendocrine measures while people were resting over a 12-hour period, which was what people thought would be a good way to measure it. There were then arguments that maybe it's much better to get the morning rise, meaning you get a measurement early on and then a little while after the people get up from bed. That was actually very complicated for respondents and we abandoned it. We also sought to get heart rate variability, which ended up taking about 30 minutes as part of the physical exam and lengthened the exam too much to be comfortable for respondents. It also, and this was an issue that came up a few times, it also was something we could not give the respondents a measure for. So this was a very experimental kind of measurement, getting heart rate variability over a 20-minute period, different from your typical EKG. And we don't have any clinical notion of what high or low are. And the respondents got confused because normally they do an EKG in two or three minutes. And it wasn't clear what they would be getting from this kind of measurement. So it was abandoned, along with an effort to take a facial photo um, that we wanted as a way of estimating age but that also was perceived as not comfortable by the respondents. So doing biomarker kind of work is often much more complicated in the field than asking questions, although of course questions themselves can be sensitive. So what are some of the many logistical and ethical issues we faced in this operation? I've already mentioned you get a higher non-response rate when you're bringing people in for a full medical exam than you do when you just get a questionnaire. We had one hospital in every PSU covering the entire country of Taiwan. Logistically, that was complicated. Uh, the people in the Ministry of Health in Taiwan had to spend a lot of time identifying a high-quality hospital and getting consents from the hospital to take part in our study. And they did an amazingly terrific job of doing that, not something that would be very difficult to do elsewhere, I think. We had to identify a lab that was capable of picking up a national sample of, of specimens that didn't operate just in one area and a lab we could validate with a lab in the United States. Um, we had to coordinate the lab pickup early. All people were coming in in the morning since they were fasting and you didn't want to leave the specimens hanging around in a hot climate for a very long time. Um, the urine collection, I'll show you some photos. And I seem to always show these photos because I think logistically it was the most complicated part of our operation. Getting 12-hour urine um, is not easy to do, and the preparation and the protocol were quite complicated, but the compliance was you know, almost universal. It was, it was above 90%. We had to evaluate the consistency of lab assays over time because we did this in 2000 and again in 2006, and assays often change. Um, as everybody does, we had to obtain informed consent. It's a little bit more complicated when you collect biological data, especially if you collect genetic markers. And I should point out, people think of Taiwan as a very highly educated society, highly industrialized, all of which is true today. But our respondents are 50 and older. Many are 70 and older. And they were born at a time when Taiwan was a largely rural, minimally educated population. Of the original sample, half of the women had absolutely no education whatsoever. So obtaining informed consent for some women actually required doing a fingerprint as opposed to a signature. And so you begin to question, you know, what is it that people can really understand about why you're collecting these biological measures and genetic markers? And that wasn't so easy to explain. Um, we included the abdominal ultrasound that required extra space. We had to think about what lab results we could report to the respondent if it was completely experimental, like the cortisol or norepinephrine. We have no clinical cut points for those. Um, we could not report them. And we had to think about storage of, of specimens and shipping horrors. I say shipping horrors because in one test case, fortunately a test case, as we were shipping specimens, 
from Taiwan back to the U.S., there was a lot of confusion between the Republic of China, which is Taiwan, and the People's Republic of China. Um, and that can really kind of muck you up if they go to the wrong place or they, they think they're coming from the wrong place. Okay, so just some photos. Here the idea was we needed these kinds of dry ice when we were delivering these urine containers to every respondent the night before their medical exam. They were not going to be storing the 12-hour urine in tiny refrigerators. They were going to keep it in special styrofoam and we needed a cooling system. Here are the examples of the styrofoam containers with the urine container sitting in the middle of it. Our staff is very energetically packing these up before they're getting delivered and now they're getting delivered. Um, so, as I say, it was a complicated protocol, but with very high compliance. Um, here I mention, um, I, I give you a picture of um, a piece of one of the hospitals where we did the medical exam of respondents. You can see it's very attractive space. It also has these curtains around it within the room because we were doing an abdominal ultrasound. Um, so the participation of hospitals was really overwhelming, the extent to which they were cooperative and were not only willing but also eager to give us space to do this kind of operation. I always felt if I had been in an American hospital, we would have been tossed out um, requesting this kind of, of participation. Okay, so what has been found? Um, I'm only going to give you insights to a few of our papers. Um, you can click on this link and you'll see um, many other publications that have come out of this. Most of the papers I'm going to talk about now um, were co-authored by the three of us online, myself, Max Weinstein, Dana Gly. Um, quite a few also involved other collaborators, very often doctoral students and postdocs. Okay, so one of the things we really wanted to do the most was test this theory of allostatic load that I've described. Um, many of our papers actually found pretty weak links between what I say, quote, stress, stressful experience in the environment and physiological dysregulation. We've done quite a bit of comparative work. One study looked at Taiwan, the US, and Russia, suggesting that the link is much stronger in Russia than the US or Taiwan, all of which suggests to us that if you, perhaps if you go to a society where stressors are really more serious, um, you will see stronger results. But let me give you an indication of some of our results here. And I should note that we're really not of, out of line with the literature. What we discovered is that many of the literature, uh, many of the papers in the, in the literature rely on significant findings rather than strong findings. And our interest here was often in the magnitude of results, not the statistical significance. So even if something was statistically significant, we would often say yes, but it's actually fairly weak. Here we have um, a paper from Taiwan that uses several waves of data. The Taiwan data are so rich that what really perplexed us in doing this paper was how to summarize many waves of data, and we were using CBS together with um, TILSA here, of stresses collected over time in different domains of people's lives. It's very hard to compile that. You can't look at everything separately or you're in a situation with hundreds of variables, particularly since we cared about not just the number of stresses people experienced, but we call their level of vulnerability, their socioeconomic status, their social participation, their frequency of contact with children and others, their optimism, their attitudes toward life that may make them more susceptible to stressors. And so that was a wealth of information that here is summarized in the simple graph that says, how are stressors, the number of stressors related to people's dysregulation score? This is actually a count of how many biomarkers of those biomarkers I listed are extremely low or extremely high, out of normal operating ranges. The expectation is the more stressors, the higher that score. And what this figure shows is that is true, but where the slope is really steep, that is, where the relationship is really strong, happens when vulnerability is high, i.e., this greenish line on top says when vulnerability is at the 90th percentile. This is, this is picking up people of low socioeconomic status, people with low levels of emotional support, all right, then you really see a strong relationship. At the median, it's a very weak relationship. Okay, 
a question we repeatedly ask ourselves because we've been through this process. We know what it takes to collect biomarkers. It's not only difficult for those doing the survey, but it imposes a big burden on the respondents. And Dana is always very fond of saying, is the blood worth the toil, the sweat, and the tears? And it's a hard question to answer because biomarkers can do many things, and we have used them in our papers to do many different things. For example, they can be more precise measurements of illness. You get a better measurement, potentially, of hypertension or diabetes by using a biomarker than asking a self-report. But here we asked a specific question. Do biomarkers help us predict short-term mortality above and beyond what we can do with the kinds of self-reported measures surveys typically incorporate? And the short answer, I'll show this to you graphically, is yes. Individual markers do better than the kinds of scores we and many others use because it's really hard to model every individual biomarker separately. And if you ask the question, what does information on change in biomarkers do to us, do for us? We now have two rounds. Do we do even better? And the answer is modestly. Um, I'll show you this in a second. What I won't show you, but we'll just report, is that we asked a similar question with regard to those performance assessments I talked about. The timed walk, the chair stands, the lung function. And the question there is, do they predict mortality beyond what all the self-reported ADLs, IADLs, mobility limitations would do for you? And the answer to that is also yes. Okay. So now I'm going to show you this complicated figure that comes out of a paper in Population and Development Review and show you a few of the results. So I'll start by just mentioning this, this funny symbol, AUC, stands for the Area Under the Receiver Operating Characteristic Curve. You can just get that out of your heads. Um, but just think of it as a measure of how well a model discriminates between people who survive and people who die. Okay, And if it was a value of 1, it would do it perfectly. If it was 0.5, it would be like tossing a random coin. So you want a high value of this. What we then said is if you get a decent predictive model, which we can do with all the information we have, how much does adding self-report to biomarkers improve the model? And the basic feeling there is if you can improve it by at least 0.01, that's not trivial. Okay, It's kind of hard to improve a good model a lot, hence that value is pretty low. So if we look at what putting in self, seven self-reported health indicators does, this is how much it improves the model. If you go down to the scale, it looks like it's something like 0.07, substantial. If I look at my second arrow and I look only at the flesh part, this is what 19 biomarkers would do for us, about the same. So 19 biomarkers does the same as seven variables, but one of those variables is actually an index of all sorts of functional limitations. So that's actually pretty good for the biomarkers. Okay, if I now compare, um, if I now ask the question, what happens if I add biomarkers to a model that already has self-reports? I'm looking at my third arrow here, and I'm saying, even if I have self-reports, which improves the model, adding biomarkers does a non-trivial job. I now say, okay, but I have two rounds of biomarkers. How much more do I benefit in predicting five-year mortality? And the answer is this green part. And the answer here is it's pretty modest. It, it's sometimes statistically significant depending on what measure you use, sometimes not. If you already have 2006 biomarkers, adding 2001, going back in time and looking at change, does not buy you a lot. If all you have are 2001 and you're predicting survival after 2006, then the change actually buys you a lot, not shown here, because you're getting an update in the process you're implicitly getting biomarkers at the second point in time, which is important for predicting mortality after that. And the final point I'll make by comparing um, this, these, this row here, hopefully you can see my arrow in this row here, the second and the third from the bottom, is simply that if you take a summary score, an index that sums up, let's say, all the biomarkers that are out of normal operating ranges, and you compare its prediction with the individual biomarkers, the bottom line of the story is you do a fair amount better by using the data on the individual biomarkers. Okay, um, Let me very briefly um, mention this other study that we tried to do that said, which biomarkers do the best? Is it the standard clinical ones? Are these other biomarkers that are called disease progression? Or are these non-clinical markers, neuroendocrine and immune markers? Do they do a decent job? Most of us expecting the standard clinical markers to do the best job. Okay, in predict, again, predicting five-year survival. 
And this little model, if you just look at this area under the curve, what you see is that the standard clinical markers improve it by 0.01. It's actually significant, but it's small. But the other markers do a much better job, and that's been something we keep learning, that the standard clinical markers, at least at this age range, don't do a terrific job in predicting survival. Non-clinical markers, particularly immune markers, and what I call disease progression, things that are measuring already the beginning either of infection or kidney or liver function, do a better job. Okay. And um, I know I'm going through this quickly. It's to give you kind of a taste, and, and all of the sources are shown here from these papers that you could do a better job of, of reading the details. This was a paper trying to say, now we have all these biomarkers. Do they help us understand why males at these ages die at much higher rates than females? If we take a base model, we see the odds ratios of males dying compared to females is something like 2.3, consistent with other literature. Okay. If we add smoking, that reduces it by 55%, which is to say smoking accounts a lot for men's disadvantage compared to females. Perfectly predictable and consistent with the literature. If we put in the standard cardiovascular and metabolic markers, it doesn't explain anything. In fact, women have um, do better at these so that uh, women rather have more extreme markers so that it, it extends, it increases the odds ratio for men compared to women. It does not explain why men have higher odds than women. The only markers that help explain why male are dying at higher rates at these ages than women are things called disease progression markers. And the ones in particular um, that seemed to play a role um, were things like um, IL-6, um, white blood cells, measures of liver and kidney function seemed to be important. In fact, the three most important were neutrophils, a kind of white blood cell, IL-6, and albumin in explaining the excess male mortality. Okay. So I'll brief briefly mention this idea that we introduced a question I mentioned asking the interviewers to rate the respondents' health. The interviewers were asked, regarding the respondents' current state of health, you feel it is excellent, very good, good, fair, or poor? The respondent had earlier in the survey been asked, how would you rate your overall health? Excellent, very good, good, fair, or poor? And in fact, we also asked the physician the same question as the interviewer. We asked the interviewer the question at the end of the survey. We asked the physician the question at the end of their health exam. And the question here was, how well do these two people, how well do their assessments predict five-year survival compared to the respondent, him or herself? Okay. So what I'm showing you here a result from a hazard model which says, compared to a respondent who said excellent, what is the risk of dying in the next five years? For a respondent who rates himself or herself as poor, that risk of dying is 2.3 times the excellent. So this is a pattern we would expect. Okay? If we do the same for interviewers, we're putting all of these in the model at the same time with basic control variables, we get a much stronger relationship. For example, interviewers who say the respondents in poor health those respondents have seven times the odds of dying as those who say, those for whom the interviewer says the respondent is in excellent health. Okay, and the physicians, there's actually no association between the physician's ratings and the risk that the respondent dies in the next five years. If we then look at statistical significance with all of these in the model, only the interviewer ratings are significant. So one of the things we learn from this is this is a very simple question to put at the end of the interview. You don't even ask it to the respondent. The interviewer fills it out. And it buys us a lot of information on the future, presumably health, but certainly survival of the respondent at virtually no cost. OK, so the last study I want to mention is one that we're just finishing. Um, it's under review now. And we're trying to get at the issue of what matters the most for survival of all the kinds of social measurements that we've gotten, self-reports of health, biomarkers, and how does Taiwan compare to other countries? Much of what I've shown you now has been just Taiwan, but here we bring other countries into the picture. And so we looked at 57 variables, 25 of which we had in the three countries, um, actually four countries I'm going to show you, Costa Rica, the US, Taiwan, and England. These variables covered very different domains, demographic, social, health, and biological. We examined them one at a time with controls for age and sex. We used hazard models. We studied mortality, again, for a five-year follow-up period, 
and we measured how well something did by the improvement in this discrimination measure I mentioned earlier, the AUC, but we confirmed it with two other um, discrimination measures. This is a hard figure to look at, um, but I'll try to very briefly describe it. So this looks at the top 10 predictors in Costa Rica, England, if you're following my mouse, Taiwan, and the US, and the color tells you the kind of variable. So all of these on top are green, and these are all self-reported health measures, limitations with IADLs, limitations with mobility, limitations with ADLs, self-assessed health. Um, these are only um, variables in all countries, so the interviewer assessment is not part of this. Um, the red are biomarkers, and the only biomarker that appears in all four countries is C-reactive protein. But interestingly, the blue, which are environmental markers, often make it to the top 10, which is kind of surprising because health is more directly related to survival than these social variables. Education, and particularly exercise, makes it to the top in three of the four countries as a predictor of five-year survival. The second graph does the same thing, but now it's only showing you variables that were not available in all four countries, only in some of the countries. And the reason I show that is because these performance assessments were not available in the US, so they didn't appear in the previous graph. But things like gait speed, chair stands, pulmonary function, grip strength are very strong predictors of five-year survival in the countries that actually collected that information. And the second most important predictor in Taiwan is this IAH, which is interviewer assessed health, this very simple question asking the interviewer to give um, the five scale rating. These are only showing you biomarkers that improve prediction by this cutoff of 0.01, which is considered to be non-trivial, potentially important. Okay, um, so let me just summarize those two very complicated graphs. If we look at four countries at very different stages of development, the best variables in predicting five-year survival are those that have to do with physical limitations and disability from self-reports, but also from performance assessments that the interviewer carried out. The biomarkers that mattered the most, remember CRP was um, one of the markers that mattered the most, and we keep finding this, that whenever we have inflammatory markers, they are very strong predictors of survival, much more than the standard clinical markers. Albumin and homocysteine were also strong predictors. Exercise was the strongest of the environmental predictors. I mentioned interviewer assessed health was very strong in Taiwan, the only country for which we had it. And we've worked a little bit with existing prognostic, prognostic indices that physicians use to predict when patients will die, in part to think about hospice care or very um, costly interventions. And our feeling of, as a result of this is there's a lot of information that could go into clinical-based prognostic indices that are currently not there, but that this analysis suggests are very strong predictors of survival. So a brief summary of the strengths of our data. Um, the detail and breadth of indicators related to health, social environment, and life challenges. We have tremendous information there. We have many non-clinical markers that surveys often just concentrate on the standard markers. We have many especially infla inflammatory as well as neuroendocrine markers. We have performance assessments. We have a relatively large national sample for this kind of detailed information. We have high participation rates, and we have repeated longitudinal follow-up with very low loss to follow-up. Um, the weaknesses, we don't have much information about events early in life. We have a few questions, but people never started before age 50 in this enterprise. We have a smaller sample size for biomarker data than for the full household interview sample. Um, in order to obtain the breadth of information we collect, we sacrifice data on detail about any particular area. Um, and something we've all become very alerted to is that starting this enterprise, social scientists typically think that biomarkers are relatively error-free compared to social science measures. We've learned that that's not true. There's so much that goes into measurement and mismeasurement of biomarkers having to do with the accuracy of the assay, the consistency of the assay over time, freezing and defrosting problems, the fact that they're very difficult to collect. We have two measurements. Two measurements of many biomarkers is very crude. Cortisol, people would say, you probably want five or six per day over a period of weeks. That's not the kind of measurement you can do in these social science health interview surveys. Um, we want to thank everybody who participated. Wait. Um,
I just somehow we got skipped here. Okay. Okay. Sorry, that just skipped over a few slides for some reason. I want to tell you a very important thing, which is how you get the data. Okay, the data are available from NACTA, ICPSR. I'll show you the link in a second. The data set that's available is longitudinal with information from the 2000 CBAS for just over 1,000 people who completed the interview and the biomedical exam. In 2006, almost 1,300 people completed the interview and the data are for the roughly 1,000 people who did the exam. And there are a total of 639 who have exam data for both rounds because some of the people who came into 2006 were first interviewed in 2003, so they don't have the 2000 biomarker information. Um, users have to complete a data use agreement. Um, some of the information I've talked about comes from the Health Promotion Administration, which is part of the Ministry of Health in Taiwan. Um, as part of the SILSA, TILSA data collection, if you're interested in those data, we've put out a cohort profile in the International Journal of Epidemiology. I've given you the link to that, and that tells you how to request the TILSA type information that's not available on this NACTA data set. This next slide gives you the link to the NACTA ICPSR data set. Um, and so we want to acknowledge various people the Surveillance and Health Research Division of the Health Promotion Industry Administration and the Ministry of Health and Welfare in Taiwan, um, ISTAT Healthcare Consulting, the hospitals um, that took part in this, and Union Clinical Laboratory in Taipei, and particularly these two laboratory um, workers who did many, many assays. The study was supported by um, this various grouping here, um, the National Institute on Aging through various grants to both Princeton and Georgetown for the collection of the CBS 2000 and the CBS 2006, the Health Promotion Administration that's part of the Ministry of Health in Taiwan. Um, the initial funding for TILSA came from the Department of Health in Taiwan as well as the Taiwan Provincial Government and the National Health Research Institute. And finally, we want to thank everybody who participated. Somehow it just likes to exit when that's done. Okay, so at this point we would like to take questions. Can people hear me? Yes, Noreen, we um, yeah. are, don't have questions in the queue right now, um, so uh, we'll wait a couple minutes more and see. Um, oh, here, here come some questions now, so I'll let you, let you all go here. Uh, so there is a question. I'll read it out loud because I don't think you guys see the questions. Any follow-up studies planned? Um, so I mentioned uh, very briefly that we are in the field now. I say we, but it's part of the TILSA, the parent operation. And what that study is doing right now is collecting the performance assessments for the CBAS respondents who were a subsample of TILSA. Okay, we, are, um, we have been doing some other assays of frozen specimens. I didn't go into detail, but for example, in 2006, we collected some additional um, immune and inflammatory markers, and then we used frozen specimens from 2000 to get those same markers. So we very recently have been doing some additional markers um, that we hope to get funding to add to the public use data set. So it's not study in the field, but it's collecting of additional biomarkers from specimens. Oops. Um, how many? So there's a question uh, that says, I think, how many samples do you think are enough for making biomarker data? Um, I'm not, I'm not quite sure of that question. I mean, it, it depends particularly on the kind of analysis you're trying to do. I assume the question has to do with how much are enough to have enough statistical power to see the associations you want to see. I mean, in some cases, we've had 1,000. In some cases, if we wanted to use both rounds of data, we've had more like 600. That's certainly enough to see something that's notable, of notable strength if you're searching for a very 
small effect, that might not be enough, but some would say if it's very small, you might not really care about that. But, you know, it really depends, the statistical power really depends on the difference in the biomarker values between the groups you're hoping to compare, and that's really hard to answer without some additional numbers. I don't know, um, Dana or Max, if you would like to add to that answer. Uh, can you hear me? I can. Okay. Um, yeah, I, this is Dana speaking. I, I think that's a good answer. I mean, I think one issue for us was initially we thought we wanted, you guys thought you wanted to get at least a thousand people in the biomarker sample in order to do the kinds, to answer the kinds of questions that you were interested in. And in the second round, you know, some people had already died and so we are reduced to a sample now of 639 people who were able to complete the second round. So, you know, that got to kind of a minimum of what we thought was really um, sufficient to, to do the sorts of analyses we were interested in. And so in some ways, that's partly why we're not really following that cohort any farther because there just there's not enough people left in it. For biomarker collection, I should add, because we are still following them um, for other outcomes. So there's another question here, Noreen. Uh, could the biomarkers be applied in the hospitals now? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not, not sure, sure what I that means. That. Yeah. Um, could they be collected? So these biomarkers, I don't know if the question may have to do with do you really require a hospital to collect these kinds of biomarkers? Originally, we did because to do venipuncture, it was required to have a physician do it. There are a number of surveys operating elsewhere that are able to do venipuncture with a phlebotomist, somebody trained in collecting blood from veins. It's not somebody uh, with the credentials of a physician. Um, so that kind of blood collection could be done in many places with trained phlebotomists. Rather, however, we were doing other things in a hospital like a complete medical exam, which of course would be impossible to do in somebody's home. Noreen, I think maybe the question is getting at whether something like C-reactive protein could be used now as a marker. Uh, a clinical marker. A clinical marker. I see. Yes, yeah, so C-reactive protein, it, I think, is the only one of our measurements that has now begun to be used clinical, clinically. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, no, I think that's right. I think aside from the standard markers that, you know, we all knew at the beginning were standard markers, C-reactive protein is probably the only one that since we collected it has now become more, uh, it has a standard cutoff that's considered high risk and, and clinicians do use it as a risk factor for cardiovascular disease as well as, you know, other, other um, potential diseases. So I don't know if there are any additional questions. It doesn't look like it, but it's also that we've just completed our scheduled one hour. So unless somebody types very quickly, I would say that we are ending the webinar now with a thank you to everybody who logged on. Um, and to my colleagues, Max Weinstein and Dana Glatt.